Florida. I want to thank everybody for coming out here to the High Point tonight. The High Point is a great theater, and we're so lucky to get to see these great Vincent Price movies on this big screen. Um, and and the theaters, what I love about this theater is the marquee. All these, all these roads sort of connect, the highway connects. You have to drive by the High Point Theater just, just to get about everywhere in St. Louis, and it just pleases me so much to see the word Vincentennial so big on that marquee. Um, this is our last presentation here at the High Point. Brown Hall is, a, is an excellent venue. They just don't have the killer marquee, but that's okay. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. I especially want to give a shout out to the people who came from other cities. I've had so many people come up to me over the weekend. I've had people from Pennsylvania, from Ohio, from Kansas, from Indiana, um, all over. And to this morning, I met a fellow who flew in last night from London, England, a Vincent Price fan. All the way to St. Louis, just to help us celebrate the centennial of Vincent Price's birth. I think, I think that really says a lot about the devotion of Vincent Price's fans. And I think you know, the enthusiasm, the publicity, the attendance uh, is, is a testament to uh, the goodwill that the memory of Vincent Price generates. And I just want to say uh, St. Louis loves Vincent Price. We are so thrilled that Roger Corbin accepted our invitation to come to Vincentennial. He was, of course, our very first choice as a special guest of honor. And when he uh, committed to coming, I, Cliff and I sat down and Cliff said, well, what journalist could we bring in to interview Mr. Corman? And without hesitation, my first words were Tim Lucas. Um, and we're super excited that Tim also accepted our offer. Um, Tim is a world-renowned film scholar and novelist. Tim is the editor of Video Watchdog magazine. He is the author of the novel, uh, The Renfield, um, Book of Renfield, I'm sorry, and the biography, Mario Bava, All the Colors of the Dark. Um, an epic 10 years in the making of the book. Um, he's also very recently recipient of the, in the, uh, Rondo Classic Horror Hall of Fame Award that we just got that last weekend. That's a meaningful award for Tim. So uh, please welcome from Cincinnati, Ohio, to interview Roger Corman, Mr. Tim Lucas. Features 
appropriately for Vincent Tennille, a specially commissioned uh, piece of artwork, Vincent Price. So we can have Roger, Tom Stockman, and Tim Lewis please come up and we will make the presentation. For those of you who weren't here last night, we discussed Roger's association with Vincent Price. Tonight we're going to cover his general career, which is somewhat more daunting because it's 500 some pictures, a, a record that's unlikely, unlikely to be equaled in anyone's lifetime. Um, it's amazing to me that in, in doing all of that, you also had the, the courage and the wit to invest these films with satire and social commentary. Um, how did it occur to you to, to make these films more personal? I've always felt that uh, motion pictures are the quintessential uh, modern art form. They're a combination. First, uh, they consist of the moving image, which was not present in the traditional art forms. So the moving image makes motion pictures modern. The other thing that makes them modern is that they are a combination of art and business. Uh, a painter just paints, a writer can just write. But to make a motion picture, you need financing, you need a crew. So motion pictures are modern in the fact that they are art and business, and they are therefore a compromised art form. We live in a compromised age. Um, when you first entered the film business, or even before, who were your first heroes? in the business, who did you want to emulate? Before I really became first a writer, and then a producer, and then a director, I wasn't that much aware of individual filmmakers. But as I, I had a degree in engineering, I didn't have the opportunity to go to film school. But as I came into the business and began to watch other um, directors, producers, and so forth, I would think uh, Howard Hawks, John Ford and Alfred Hitchcock probably were my primary influences. And how would you say their work in particular informed your own? Uh, Howard Hawks had a great uh, concept of pacing, of characterization, of the pacing of the performances. John Ford, uh, equally uh, a good a director, a great director, uh, was one of the first to utilize the to great effect, the long shot, the great long shots in his westerns, from which he would then cut to a close-up, uh, impressed me greatly. Alfred Hitchcock, everybody knows uh, pretty much his style, his technique, his use of suspense, his editing, building through incidents to uh, moments of shock and, uh, and action and sometimes horror, uh, I thought were brilliant. I don't personally believe there are any accidental steps in anyone's life. I think they all sort of accumulate to make you the person that you are. So how did your degree in industrial engineering benefit you as a filmmaker? Uh, well, actually, I was a senior uh, at Stanford, and I was writing for the Stanford Daily. And I found out that the film critics on the Daily got free passes to the theaters in Belmont. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I'd like to get uh, free passes. I wrote uh, some sample reviews. They took me on. I did indeed get the free passes. But then, uh, looking at the films, which I looked at them primarily as entertainment before, and still as a critic, and you as a critic uh, will understand this, you're still being entertained by the film, but you're analyzing it as well because you know you're going to be writing a review afterwards. And that really got me to be uh, more involved, more interested in films, 
and decidedly uh, uh, not to be an engineer. I started off in my follow up from father's footsteps as an engineer, and I uh, just started making films. I was the, I shouldn't say I started making films after a long time. I was the failure of the Stanford engineering class that year. Everybody got good jobs but me. The only job I could get was as a messenger riding a bike around 20th Century Fox delivering the mail. <laughs> what did that job teach you about filmmaking? Did it give you a leg up? Uh, and, and what was the basic story between you being a messenger at Fox to getting your first uh, production job together? Well, it is a long story. It took me uh, five or six years, but I'll make it very quick. Um, at that time, motion picture production was six days a week. The office was open five days a week. I volunteered to work a six-day for nothing if I could be on the set. And they said, why not? And uh, I was on the set and observing. I learned from what was going on on the set. I was then promoted to a story analyst, which really means reader. And uh, I did fairly well as a story analyst, but became a little bit disillusioned with uh, the way things were going. So I went to Europe, I did postgraduate work at Oxford in English literature, came back, knocked around, and finally sold a script. And I said to the producer, uh, as part of our negotiations, I will work for you for nothing as your assistant if you'll give me an associate producer credit. He said, again, why not? A guy, a guy working for him for nothing. But that was important because credits are important establish who you are. I was therefore, I had official, officially, I had a credit as an associate producer and a writer. So I set myself up as a writer, producer in a little one room office uh, on Sunset Boulevard. I raised $12,000 and made my first film as a producer, writer, producer, called It Stalked the Ocean Floor. I sold it to a small independent distribution company who felt my title was too arty and they changed the title to Monster from the Ocean Floor. And I took the profits from that, did The Fast and the Furious, which was successful for me. I sold that title a few years ago to Universal and it's done extremely well for them as well. And on the next film, Pop Guns West, I became a director and I just continued from there. Well, that story that you, that you told shows that you had a remarkably developed sense of business at a young age. Where, where did you pick that up? Um, I was a child of the Depression. Um, my father was never out of work or anything like that, but we lived in reduced circumstances. I barely understood it because I was so young, but I absorbed some of those, uh, some of those lessons, and I think that probably uh, influenced me. So how much of, of that story that you told, the sequence of events, was strategy, and how much was luck? It was a portion of both. I was lucky to be in the right place at the right time. The rest of it was strategy. I think with most people, whether you're making motion pictures or whatever field you're in, there's a combination of your own ability and a little bit of luck. One of, one of the interesting stories that I, I, I find fascinating that, about your business sense is when, uh, when I first saw Monster from the Ocean Floor, I saw that a lot of attention was paid to a certain prop. It was an underwater scooter of some kind, and I thought to myself, I bet he got the funding together to present this film as a commercial for this product. Is that basically what happened? You're very close. <laughs> um, I was reading the Los Angeles Times, and I saw an article uh, on a company called Aerojet General, who had developed a miniature one-man submarine. I called them, told them that I was a, a, a producer and that I would like to make a picture and publicize their submarine if they would lend me the submarine and people to operate it. They were happy to get, get the publicity. They had no idea I was a producer with no money whatsoever. <laughs> but based upon that, I raised the money. I, I took the, uh, the initial money was from the sale of my script, uh, my, which
which I called the house in the sea. Uh, and I combined that with uh, money I raised from other sources. Production value. Um, there's a note on the Internet Movie Database that I find very funny. Uh, there's a quote, and it's, as, as the film opens, and we're talking about Monster from the Ocean Floor, the camera pans to a landscape where, quote, no white man has ever been. At the top right of the screen, a car can be seen traveling down the Pacific Coast Highway <laughs> where the scene was filmed. Now, the Pacific Coast Highway has always been a very central location in your work, and I was just wondering, in the 50 years that you've been making films, how have you seen the Pacific Coast and the locations that have been so important to your work change? The Sunset Strip and so on. Well, uh, that's the Pacific Coast Highway north of Malibu. Incidentally, uh, that quote is true, but nobody has ever noticed um, that uh, that car. It was far in the distance. We were shooting at a beach called Carrillo Beach, uh, north of Malibu. And the quote must have come from me. I must have mentioned it because nobody ever has seen it. Um, the Pacific Coast Highway in Malibu has developed. Matter of fact, Larry Terman, uh, a producer he produced, a graduate, who's a good friend of mine, had an end of the sea, end of the season party at his house in Malibu in June on the basis the highway was impassable for the rest of the summer. It's become so crowded. Um, how did you come into contact with uh, the gentleman at that American uh, releasing corporation originally, which became American International Pictures, uh, Jim Nicholson and Sam Markoff? How did your paths first cross? Well, Monster from the Ocean Floor was fairly successful, and it gave me the money to make the Fast and the Furious, but I could see the trap for the independent producer. You raised the money, you made the picture, then you waited for the picture, to pay back before you could make another picture, which meant if you were lucky, you could make a picture a year, and I had no intention of, of waiting that way. The Fast and the Furious was, for a low-budget picture, a pretty good little picture, and I had offers from a number of the low-budget distributors uh, with, uh, to distribute it. Uh, but uh, I met Sam, uh, Sam Harbaugh and Jim Nicholson, who were about to start American International, and they were raising money too, and they wanted my picture, but they never distributed a film. And I said to them, I will go with you, but I want a three-picture guarantee. I can finance these films, but what I want is as soon as I finish a picture, I want you to pay me back my negative cost so that I can start immediately on another picture and I will gamble with you as to whether or not we go into profits. So that three-picture deal enabled me uh, to make uh, pictures one after another, and it enabled American International uh, to get started as a distribution company. As I understand it, you would typically originate the storylines of, of all your pictures, and then you would assign writers to them. So where did you find your writers in the early days, and how closely did you work with them? And and how does that differ from how you work now? Uh, the basic process has not changed very much. Um, almost every picture I made uh, was originally my idea. Sometimes I would buy a novel such as The Intruder, or I would take a, a published work such as the works of Edgar Allan Poe, uh, but I would have the idea. I would write a short treatment, no more than five or six pages, bring in a screenwriter and work with him going through one, two, three, sometimes four or five drafts uh, before we were ready to shoot. Did you preserve any of this paperwork, the original treatments? I probably should have. I know some directors who have the scripts of every picture they've ever made bound in leather in their libraries. Uh, I just not necessarily threw the scripts away, but I forgot about them because I was already working on the next script. So most of the scripts of the early pictures uh, are not in existence. Well, as this reel that we watched shows, um, it's just astounding how much talent you've discovered and fostered over the years. Jack Nicholson, Bruce Dern, uh, the list just goes on and on and on. And you, I've seen you on, on various talk shows commenting, and you would name each, each of the people or the host would give you the name and you would 
come up with uh, short comments on each of them. But there were so many secondary actors who were so phenomenal, I haven't really heard you speak about them at any length. So I'd like to just mention some names to you of people who, who really deserve to be remembered and then give your comments. Uh, the first is the great character actor, Dick Miller. Uh, Dick Miller uh, was a very, very good actor who had uh, worked off Broadway in New York, uh, came to Hollywood. Uh, I met him through uh, Jonathan Hayes, who was an actor I knew. Dick really wanted to be a writer at that time, but I hired him as an actor. He was very good, and what I tried to do, both with the actors I worked with and the crews I worked with, was, for instance, I can give you an example on the crew. After my first picture, I wrote down the names of everybody on the crew and gave them a one or two or a three rating. The number one rating was higher than that, they're excellent. The number two rating was they're okay, if I can't find anybody, better hire them back. Number three was don't have anything to do with these guys ever again. And I did roughly the same thing with actors which was one of the reasons we were able to work so well, so actually, I don't know, well is the right word, so efficiently and so rapidly, because the actors and the crew and I knew each other, and we got to be able to work together. The crew became so well known, it was called the Corman Crew, and other producers would just hire the, the entire Corman Crew to have a ready-made crew. Now, as I understand it, he was actually short in stature, and this got in the way of his doing lead roles, but you did give him lead roles in a couple of pictures, like War of the Satellites and, and Rock All Night. Yes. Was his height a problem? His height was a problem. Matter of fact, Rock All Night, uh, the key poor part of this was that he was a very cocky little guy, and Rock All Night did very well, and uh, Dick was excellent in it, and it really did prepare, propel his career so that he worked around town and with, with many companies. Okay. Another one that I'd like to know about is the star of, not, not a film that you made, but The Attack of the 50-Foot Woman. She was with you in The Undead, and Allison Hayes. Allison Hayes uh, was one of my favorite actresses. For uh, She was very beautiful, very voluptuous, and when my friend Barney Wilner did Attack of the 50-Foot Woman, he asked for somebody who uh, it was great looking, and I recommended Allison. For some reason, I don't know why, Allison always played the second lead with me. Beverly Garland or somebody else was always the lead, and Allison was always the second lead. Now, this is someone that I'm particularly sweet on. Uh, she was with you in Bucket of Blood, and she ended up in Desaad briefly, and, and she also has my, my favorite role in the, in the trip, and that's Barbara Morris. Barbara Morris was uh, one of the most talented actresses that I've ever worked with. She'd come out of UCLA, where she'd been uh, more or less the star of the drama school. Uh, she was a very sensitive, a very intelligent actress, uh, had a good career. Uh, it was one of those things, she was attractive, but not beautiful, and uh, that limited her career to a certain extent. Uh, the star of The Lost Woman and Sorority Girl, which I think is one of the best pictures you made in the 50s, Susan Cabot. Susan Cabot, uh, unlike Barbara, who was limited a little bit, had everything. Uh, she was very beautiful. She was an excellent actress. Uh, she was under, under contract. She had starred uh, off Broadway, had been signed by Universal, was uh, co starring with. Uh, Rock Hudson in one picture, a couple of pictures, uh, and uh, simply got into an argument uh, with the head of the studio and with a couple of directors, and uh, they dropped her option. I was lucky enough to work with her, but uh, she was limited by uh, some temperament. <laughs> um, what about the, uh, the fellow who, who wrote Little Shop of Horrors, and uh, 
The Undead. And I, I believe he's the only screenwriter other than William Shakespeare to write a script in iambic pentameter. Uh, yeah. Chuck Griffith. Uh, Chuck Griffith, uh, I've forgotten how I met Chuck, but Chuck was uh, a good friend of mine. He wrote a number of scripts for me and uh, always wrote bigger than anything I could shoot. I would tell him, look, Chuck, I've got 10 days. There are going to be three sets. I remember one time, and Julie was with me uh, in Rome when I was talking to him uh, about doing a picture in Rome, and I said I wanted uh, a conflict between these two uh, feudal lords, and I just had a small amount of money. The opening scene, one king with his vast army approaches the king uh, of another country with his vast army. And I said, Chuck, you know, I couldn't even afford the first scene in this picture, much less the rest of it. So Chuck was one of the most talented guys I ever worked with and very funny. What do you remember about uh, your first day of, on the set as a, as a director? Were you nervous? I was extremely nervous. Uh, I was so nervous I couldn't eat lunch. And uh, the caterer realized I wasn't eating lunch and finally he brought me a little salad starting with the third day. Every director I've ever worked with has been nervous on his first day except Ron Howard. <laughs> Ron was totally cool uh, on his very first day. As, as a director, uh, to what extent do you pre-plan? Do you storyboard? Uh, I storyboard to a certain extent. I'm a great believer in uh, preparation, working with a number of young directors as I have. Um, I try to tell them the importance of preparation, particularly working as we do with low budgets. You, the director cannot come on the set and say, look around and say, where do I put the camera? He must have storyboarded and be able to come on the set and say, the camera goes there and go immediately into production. He must have his uh, picture planned as completely as possible. And I also tell them this, you will never follow your plan 100%. Uh, things that seemed right to you in pre-production, you can do, or you get a better idea. But at least if you have the plan, you have the skeleton, and you'll generally follow it depending on circumstances. 80, 90 percent, something like that. I'm wondering to what extent you find yourself reshaping your work in the editing room. I know you've worked with a great variety of different uh, editors, including Monty Allen. Um, so can you remember a specific moment when a particular scene or, or an entire feature snapped to life in the editing room? Um, I can remember the opposite. <laughs> uh, uh, generally, uh, you improve scene in the editing room. It's a simply matter of uh, you're looking at all your shots. If I have improved, and generally every film improves in the editing room, it's generally a matter of pacing. I will probably pick up the pacing a little bit in the editing room over what I shot. But the opposite was when I shot the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, because you're always trying to improve your cut. The first cut of the massacre was excellent. The editor and I went about improving it, and I was always convinced that we never had a cut as good as the very first cut. Now, this is something that um, doesn't happen with directors today, because then you were actually cutting the film. When you uh, went to your second cut, you were essentially cutting the film and destroying your first cut. Today you're cutting digitally, so you retain uh, on the disc your first cut, you then have your second cut on uh, the second disc and so forth, so you can go back and uh, do what I was unable to do. You can retrieve the first cut or at least take some sections from it. Many of your films uh, involve protagonists who are outsiders or people who have been exiled from the mainstream of society. Uh, and in later films, they even become outright rebels. And you've also shown a lot of interest in gangsters as protagonists. What attracts you to these characters? Uh, first, they're more interesting. They're more dramatic. 
That would be the overt or conscious uh, reason for it. There's probably some psychological uh, element uh, somewhere in the back of my mind that uh, makes me identify with the rebel. Um, as a matter of fact, somebody wrote a, there was an, an article in a magazine about me, and it said, Roger Corman is Hollywood's oldest established rebel. <laughs> Well, it's, it's like Jonathan Demme said at the Oscar ceremony. He thought you were going to stick it to the man, even in your speech. Um, I know, actually, I did, but that was, <laughs> that was cut out of that. I, <laughs> I stuck up, um, what was in the speech here was when I talked about um, the best films are made by the innovative filmmakers who are uh, following their own vision and taking chances. That was, what was, that was the end of the speech. The beginning of the speech was, it's all too easy to take $200 million and make a sequel to a, a big success, but uh, somehow that uh, didn't appear. <laughs> uh, well, this brings us back to the whole theme of social commentary in your work, and, and the whole idea that you would weave underpinnings of social commentary into a piece of exploitation. Now, before your work, I know that there was uh, Don Siegel's invasion of the body span. There are specific references to the McCarthy era in that film, but they're, they're subtle that they weren't noticed at the time. And you can also see it to some extent in Rod Serling's Twilight Zone. But how did you uh, begin to put these things in? And did it happen subconsciously and it was pointed out to you later, or did you do it more deliberately? Uh, it was a conscious decision. Uh, I had uh, made The Intruder, which a portion of it, uh, if you saw up there, black and white about racial integration in the South with the New York actor Bill Shatner uh, in his first film, Plan to Leave. Uh, the picture got wonderful reviews, won a number of, frankly, minor film festivals, and was the first film I ever made that lost money. And uh, I thought about it, and I thought I was too, too overt in my, well, two things. One, I think people just didn't want to see a picture about segregation and integration of schools and that problem, they were trying to push that problem away. But secondarily, I felt I was too overt in my message, as it were. And motion pictures should not be messages. So I consciously uh, framed a way to make films that I would go back to entertainment films. And uh, if you know method acting technique, is what's known as the text and the subtext. The text is what is written in the script. The subtext is what the actor says. The subtext is what he means when he says it. Uh, and I felt I will use this as the model for my films. The films will be entertainments, uh, and we will deliver that entertainment as the text, but the subtext beneath the text will be a theme or something that is important to me, but it will always be subordinate to the text. Now an interesting thing happens in the course of your career as we approach the end of the 1950s, and that is that French critics begin to pay your films particular serious attention. They begin to call you an auteur. They point out films that Machine Gun Kelly, for example, as being especially insightful and important. When you read these things or when they're translated for you, does your work become more self-conscious? It did. I was really surprised. Machine Gun Kelly was uh, a little black and white ten-day uh, gangster picture starring again an unknown new actor, Charlie Bronson. And it was quite successful in the United States, but it was a bigger success in Europe. And somebody sent me some reviews from the critics from Cahiers Cinema the new way of critics and so forth, really praised the film and praised Charlie. And uh, it made me a little more self-conscious. And I'm not certain it helped the films. I may have uh, uh, taken myself a little bit overly serious as a result of that, but it sure helped Charlie. Uh, uh, he was immediately uh, signed by a French producer, then by uh, Italian producer and emerged as one of the biggest stars in the world, but he was working in Europe the same way Clint Eastwood did a few years later, 
and he did the same thing Clint and uh, that Clint did. Charles Bronson and Clint Eastwood came back to America already established. The shocking, oh, which brings up a minor book, the shocking thing is I, I was talking to some young interviewer and he was talking about the number of actors uh, who'd gone on to good careers who had started with being listed in some of them. And I said, well, there's also Charles Bronson. And he said, who is Charles Bronson? And I thought, the years go by. He was one of the biggest stars in the world. And this young uh, critic did not know the name. He should have his, his card revoked. <laughs> Um, one thing that impresses me about films that were made in this time period is that when you were doing this, there was actually, especially in the ranks that you were working in, independent film, um, there was very little hope that these films would have much of a shelf life after the time of their theatrical exhibition. I, didn't, I don't know if you ever thought they would turn up on television, but certainly not video, and, and to be watched again and again and again. So knowing that your film was only going to be on for maybe a week in front of people, where does the impetus come to put such craft into your work? I think anybody uh, working in a craft, and the word craft is significant because Vincent Price and I were talking about that one time, and we sort of came to the conclusion that we were craftsmen, that we should, we should not call ourselves artists. We should say we are skilled craftsmen working at our craft. If some of our work rises to the level of art, that's great, but we should think of ourselves as craftsmen. But I forgot to do that. Well, my, my point was is that, well, I, I guess it's just taking pride in your work. That's, yes. that's what we're Yes, that's what I was starting to say. I, I digress. I think anybody uh, working in such a way takes pride in his work, a cabinet maker, wants to make the best cabinet he can. Uh, although I've seen some guys particularly working in my own house who didn't seem to have quite that dedication. But I think most craftsmen, most, most people working, want to work well. Um, as, as I introduced you yesterday, I said uh, you know, that yesterday was Judgment Day and we were lucky to have the director of the day the world ended with us. Um, <laughs> Uh, that, that's actually another recurring theme in your work, the, the end of times, people who were in a very dramatic situation because life as we know it is coming to an end. Um, you were a voracious reader of science fiction in the 1950s. Is that where your interest in the apocalypse or what that came from? It probably was that. On the other hand, maybe that was the reason I was reading uh, uh, science fiction. I think I've always been... Um, I was uh, baptized Catholic and fell away from the church very quickly, and maybe I've somehow retained a little bit of religious thoughts leading me to the apocalypse. I think the first book uh, about me ever written was called uh, The Apocalyptic Vision. Um, but it's also very uh, central to youth culture, isn't it? that sort of cynical view of the world that there's not much of a future well, no future culture is very youth oriented so it's part of the audience you were reaching uh, that would be true I would be more so from my standpoint I was saying that uh, to me we don't know what the apocalypse will be we don't know what the end day will be and that's one of the most important questions of our life and uh, I would explore that to a certain extent in some of the films. I don't want to sound too pretentious there. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to ask you about Little Shop of Horrors. I know you've talked about it a lot, but when you look back at a film that took two days to film, is it, is it just a whiplash blur? What is it like to you? It started as a joke, uh, really. I was working at a small rental studio. I had an office there, and I was having lunch with the studio manager, and they had built a very nice set and uh, nobody was coming into the studio. And uh, I said, well, as long as that sets up, if you will leave it, um, uh, I, I'll come in and shoot it. And uh, he said, fine. And Chuck Griffith and I, um, actually what we did, we, uh, I had the idea. And uh, Chuck and I uh, 
this was somewhere, uh, I guess, uh, in the hippie days, and we wandered from up and down Sunset Strip, uh, from one coffee house to another, writing, uh, writing the treatment as we went. We ended up at Chez Paulette, where an actress we knew was working as a, a waitress who hadn't yet uh, emerged, Sally Kellerman. And as the uh, place closed, Sally sat down with us and she worked on the uh, climax of the story with us. And Chuck then wrote the script in 10 days, and I shot it in two days and one night. <laughs> uh, Cliff, I'm, I'm a little confused on time. How much more time do we have? Uh, maybe 10 more minutes. Okay, fine. Um, <clears throat> after the Poe films, you jumped from a sort of 19th century period of film right into the heart of contemporary times with the Wild Angels. And I'm wondering if you felt sort of insulated during the period when you were making the Poe pictures, and did you feel like you were deliberately putting yourself on the front lines of, of the 60s? Uh, to, to reach people, to reach new audience. Yes, it was a deliberate decision. Uh, the Poe pictures were quite successful. I think I did six of them, seven, something like that. And AIP wanted me to continue. But again, I had certain theories. I felt that uh, Poe had been working with the unconscious mind. The unconscious mind does not have direct contact with the world. It receives information from the eyes, the ears, the nose, whatever. And so therefore, it's an artificial environment. Uh, and I talk to the directors who start with me and I say, you should have a theory about every film. It's good if the theory is right, but it's still okay if the theory is wrong. Have some thought behind the actual action. And my thought there was to create the artificial uh, environment of the studio. I finally got tired of working in the studio, got tired of my own theory, and said I want to break away from this, and I want to go into the streets, have nothing to do with period films or shooting inside a major studio. I want to be on the street showing the contemporary environment, and the Hells Angels were uh, a phenomenon at the time. They were uh, discussed, written about, and I felt uh, they were an important cultural uh, phenomenon. Was, was it a frightening subject matter for you to approach? Was it a frightening subject matter for you to approach? No, it, was, it wasn't a frightening uh, thing. It was a challenging uh, because I wanted to work with the Hells Angels. And we only had a few professional actors in the film. The rest of them were the angels themselves. So it was a challenge. And in the back of my mind was the fact there might be violence that could uh, could emerge, but, but it never did. It's still quite a disturbing movie when you see it today. And uh, so when you presented this to, to AIP, I mean, I'm sure they had their own idea of what it was going to be. But did it shock them? And were they uh, intimidated by the prospect of releasing it? Or it did shock them. Um, but they had assumed that the film was going to be because we had, I had discussed it with them, but they gave me a great deal of freedom. Um, uh, I discussed it with them, and I said, part of it is going to be the angels coming in and uh, partially terrorizing a town. And they assumed it was going to be the story of the town people and these bad guys, the angels, were going to come in. And uh, it was not, that was not what I wanted to do at all. The angels were the protagonists. The townspeople were incidental, and that was a big surprise to AIP, but it was, I think, one of the reasons for the success of the film. Right after uh, The Wild Angels, you went on, uh, based on the success of that film, you made The Trip, which was based on a personal experience of yours. You had actually taken LSD prior to making the movie. Uh, could you tell us about that experience? Well, um, it was, it, it, that's almost correct. I took LSD before making the trip, but I had the idea of making the trip about LSD. The Hell's Angels picture uh, had to do with uh, problems in contemporary youth culture and society. LSD was becoming important. I chose 
LSD as the subject matter for my second film uh, in that style. And I then took LSD really partially because I was wondering what it was and wanted to take it, but also I felt if I'm going to direct a picture about LSD, I better take it and find out what I'm, what I'm making a picture about. You told me earlier today about your trip, but you should tell them because I think they'd be interested in the way you experience it. Well, I'm, oh, you mean uh, the, the actual vision. trip itself? Your vision. Oh, 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 I had a great vision. That was one of the problems. I had a wonderful trip. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Jack Nicholson wasn't doing that well as an actor at the time, but I knew he was a good writer, and he'd also taken LSD, so Jack wrote the script with me, and Jack had had a couple of bad experiences, and I said, we've got to put some bad experiences into this, because if it just follows my trip, it's going to be a propaganda that everybody should go out and take LSD. <laughs> uh, the image, the particular image, which was one of many images I had, was really beautiful. It was a sailing ship, a clipper ship in the sky, sailing against an orange colored sky of sunset, and the sails were rippling in the, uh, in the wind. And as the ship approached me, the uh, cloth of the ship sails sort of dissolved into diamonds, and the sails were composed of jewels moving back and forth in the wind. And as it became closer, the jewels dissolved into the shape of a woman's body, and the woman's body was floating back and forth in the wind. And I thought that was about as beautiful uh, an experience as I had. Yeah, I figured I'd better put some bad stuff in this, uh, in this picture as well as that. So there's also some Poe imagery and people dying and things like that. Yeah, I deliberately went back to Edgar Allan Poe to find uh, some uh, dark things to put in. Um, perception, actually, is, is a theme that runs through your work. Uh, you can see it in House of Usher with Vincent Price's character's hypersensitivity, um, especially in X, the Man with the X-ray Eyes, which I see as a sort of proto-LSD movie, really, because it's about uh, a man who puts droplets of, of a chemical into his eyes and, and can suddenly, he gets to a point where he sees God, essentially. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering where this interest in perception came from. I think that's, again, something that comes out of your unconscious mind. Um, perception, and particularly eyes, vision, uh, have been uh, uh, sort of a theme that runs through the films, and I'm not even certain I know why. Uh, so when did you decide uh, that you were, were you getting tired of directing? Because you, around 1970, you stopped directing pictures after Von Richthofen and Brown, and uh, you started uh, New World Pictures and focused on producing, so what motivated that? Uh, well, I was shooting by Mick Dauphin and Brown in Ireland, and I had directed, I think, somewhere between 55 and 60 pictures in about 15 years, and I was just so tired, I thought several times, I can't finish this film, but I dutifully went out to the airport and shot and finished the film, but I knew that I had to stop, and what I planned to do was to, I never planned to retire. I planned to simply stop directing films for a year to take the traditional sabbatical, rest and come back. But during that year, I got bored and I started uh, New World Pictures, which was a production distribution company. Then I started producing and New World got off to an amazing start. Every picture was successful and I just fell into into producing and stepped away from directing. Now, th this is very frustrating because obviously you've done hundreds of films since then. We have to collapse the next part of your career into just a couple of questions, but between New World Pictures and New Concord, what would you say are your, your proudest moments from those two periods of your career? Uh, some of the pictures we made, some of the directors who started with us, uh, Francis Coppola, Marty Scorsese, Jonathan Demme, Ron Howard, Jim, Jim Cameron started making low-budget science fiction models for us and emerged as the man who's made the most expensive science fiction pictures in the world. A number of the people who started with us, a number of the pictures we made, 
and also a number of the uh, foreign art films we distributed. We were the distributors for <coughs> Fellini, Bergman, Truffaut, Kurosawa, Oker uh, Slondor, Alain Rene, uh, a number of others. Probably a combination of all of them. Um, your, your most recent film through, through New Concord is uh, Sharktopus. And you have a wonderful uh, cameo. I really recommend you watch it. You know, if just for Roger's cameo, it's hilarious. Um, but something that you said about this film in an interview really struck me as interesting. You said that when the idea was first proposed to you, you thought the idea went a little too far beyond the edge of plausibility, but yet the film works and it taught you something. So where, where are films taking us now? Well, what, the story behind that uh, is I had done a picture called Dinah Clock, which I sold to the Sci-Fi Channel and it was very successful. So they wanted uh, more pictures like that. So I did um, a Dinah Shark and I did a couple of others and each one was my idea. And Sci-Fi called me one time and said, Roger, each one of the pictures is your idea, your title, but we've got a title. Uh, it's called Sharktopus. Do you want to make it? And I said, no. <laughs> and they said, why? And I said, I have a th the theories about everything. I, I have a theory that you can go up to a certain level of insanity and the audience is with you. And Dynacroc and Dynashark are within that level of insanity. But you go over this limit of insanity, the audience says, oh, what is that? And they turn against you. And I said, in my opinion, Sharktopus is above the acceptable level of insanity. But we discussed it for a while, and I'm on good terms with the Sci-Fi Channel, and I agreed to make it. Actually, I, I took my wife, Julie, and I produced the film. To our great surprise, it got the highest rating of any picture on the Sci-Fi Channel in 10 years. <laughs> so all I can say is the acceptable level of insanity is higher than I thought. <laughs> So, what is the next step of insanity? Well, uh, we have one more, which we just finished, and that's the end of it. We're, uh, we're going back to other films. I said, okay, if they're really looking for insane titles, okay, I said to everybody in the office, come up, let's see what you can come up with. And Jim Winorski, who's a director who's worked with us, came up with Piranaconda. <laughs> We've just finished making product. <laughs> it's been sold to the by channel, but I've told them this is the last one. <laughs> uh, we're going back to slightly straighter films right here. Well, this has been a great honor for me. I've been wanting to meet you since, well, you don't know, want to know how long. Um, but uh, thank you for coming and being with us during Vincent Tenney. It's been a great privilege. Thank you.